So thanks to everybody in the audience for joining and thanks to our panels for being here. And in particular, uh, thanks so much to the, uh, the sponsors of this event, uh, the National Security Law Journal uh, and the International Law Journal at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School, who along with NSI are hosting this event. Uh, I'm Jamil Jaffer, I'm the founder and executive director of NSI. And I'm really pleased to have just a terrific group of panels here today uh, to talk about uh, the topic of trolls and polls, the dangers and risks of misinformation. And by the way, for the audience, we're not gonna just talk about misinformation, we're gonna talk about, that, about disinformation and about fake news and about its impact on elections. This is one of a two, uh, two series of events. I will be having another event at this same time uh, next week uh, to talk about some of the things we might do about these. We'll talk about things we should do about uh, these issues here today, uh, but we're gonna jump right into the conversation about what's going on, why is it happening, how is it happening, and maybe some of the things we might do about it. So uh, let me start with our panelists though and describe who they are because we've got, we've got a terrific panel. Uh, I'll start first uh, with the Honorable Susan M. Gordon. Sue it currently serves as a director uh, for Khaki International, E3 Federal Solutions, and as an advisor to Palace Advisors, Primer AI, and the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. In addition, she works as a consultant with Microsoft and is a contributor to CNBC. From 2017 to 2019, Sue served as the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and previously served as the Deputy Director of NGA from 2015 and 2017 and served for 27 years, almost three decades, in the CIA, rising to senior executive positions in each of the agency's four directorates. So we're really pleased to have you with us today, Sue. Uh, Nicholas Guggenberger. Uh, Nicholas is a clinical lecturer in law and a research scholar in law and the executive director of the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. His research focuses on the intersection of law and technology, specifically platform regulation, privacy, automation of the law, and the future of private law. He's particularly interested in artificial intelligence and algorithmic governance. I already know what that is, but I'm interested to hear more about it. Uh, Nicholas has uh, frequently advised government entities, uh, served on, as expert witnesses and on advisory committees, mainly on matters re relating to financial technology, financial markets regulation, digital policy, and media law. And last but certainly not least, Lisa Kaplan. Lisa is a visiting fellow uh, at NSI. She's a founder of the Aletheia Group. Uh, and her, the goal of the Aletheia Group is to help organizations navigate the new digital reality and protect themselves against the very thing that we're talking about today, disinformation. She previously served as, as digital director for Senator Angus King's reelection campaign in 2018, where she designed and executed a proactive effort uh, to, to defend against and understand disinformation campaigns. She's among the few people who can share firsthand experience from the campaign trail on these exact issues. She previously worked as a consultant with PricewaterhouseCoopers, the US Department of State, and served as an aide in the US Senate. So uh, great to have you all here with us. Uh, Sue, Nicholas, uh, uh, Lisa, what an awesome group uh, to talk about uh, trolls and polls and disinformation. So let's just jump right in, if you all don't mind, into the conversation. Um, you know, look, I think the key thing that I've sort of thought about is, you know, ever since the 2016 elections, we've all talked about, you know, fake news and disinformation and misinformation and the role it's played in undermining our confidence in the election system, the results of the election, our elected leaders, uh, the rule of law, rule of law institutions, the FBI, the DOJ, the intelligence community. You know, I'll start with you, Sue, because you, you were there, um, uh, you know, in ODI uh, during the 2016 election. How big a role do you think that fake news uh, misinformation, disinformation really played in the 2016 elections? Um, I'm going to say less than in 2020. You think so? So your yeah. your view is that that, that it, it's it's going to be worse this year yeah. than it was four years ago, and it's pretty bad four years ago. Let's be candid. Yeah. No, it was. Listen, there is there is no doubt that particularly Russia um, was actively working to influence slash interfere and you know we're intelligence officers so we have arcane distinctions between those two interferences in the election infrastructure itself influences in trying to shape the opinion so we have good data on that um you know i don't think there's anything that's happened over time that makes us look back at the 2016 assessment and say that that we didn't have that right um and it was purposeful and it was directed from from the top uh, and it was pretty broad spectrum. Um, I don't think we had any ability to make an assessment uh, of whether it, it affected the outcome, um, but it was almost that first foray that was big enough for us to see it and having happened, now everyone's got the hint that this is a pretty good modality to go after right. and influencing. So the reason I say it's less then than now is right. because 
more people have figured out that this is actually a threat surface that can be attacked. Yeah. Yeah. So Lisa, you were involved in the 2018 election cycle. So you sort of saw the second wave of this um, in 2018. I mean, you're actively involved working with companies today to defend the 2020 election. Talk to us about, I mean, do you see the way that Sue does that, that the threat's gonna be larger now than it was before? Um, and what does the threat look like to you sort of in this, in this upcoming cycle? So I completely agree that the threat has grown exponentially. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that while the Russians may have started it, we've now got uh, over 70 countries who are actively involved in trying to further their own goals as it relates to the election. And the other thing to consider too is it's about the election, but it's not about right. the election. And what I mean by that is it's targeting issues, it's targeting um, the fault lines within our society, it's targeting um, anything that could potentially be used to try to sway you and your behavior. And I think yeah. it's important to note that we're the target. And so because of the vast amount of data that's available, because we are able to be reached through data-driven strategies on the right. issues we care about, um, this is an issue that's only going to continue to grow and it's never going to be easier to stop than it was yesterday. Yeah. And so we do yeah. need to quickly to be able to secure not just this election, but 2022, 2024, yeah. and so on. Yeah. So Nicholas, what about what about that? I mean, it, you know, uh, Sue's described as sort of a distinction between interference on one side um, and um, and Sue, what was the other term you used? Influence. Influence, influence on the other, right? And so this issue of you know uh, people trying to sort of affect hearts and minds and convince people that uh, that the election results are problematic or the elected officials are, are compromised or uh, that they should be upset about this topic or that topic create discord in our society, whether it's against one another or against our rule of law institutions. And then there's the actual interference, right? And we just heard uh, this week from the FBI and DHS that there might actually be some sort of interference going on. Um, how do you see this threat? Um, and, and you know, Lisa's told us about that this is going to be a continuing trend. Sue's, Sue already told us it's going to get it's worse this time. Lisa's saying it's going to continue through 2022 and 2024. How do you see the threat for this election? And, and, and how do you see it interference versus influence? And who are the players in this space? Yeah, thank you so much. Also, thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's a fantastic opportunity. Um, I would let, let me try to build on what uh, what Sue and Lisa have already said, and I think they're completely right in their assessment. Um, let me try to distinguish um, a couple things that are different um, than 2016. I think on the upside, what's certainly has grown is the awareness, the awareness of the problem. Um, yeah. Nobody can now claim that he or she is caught by surprise. Um, the media can't claim that. I think parts of the media have learned certain lessons when it comes to the amplification. Other parts of the media have certainly not learned um, the lessons or have internalized them in a way that actually benefits them. That meaning yeah. they have learned that they can, they can they can profit, they can profit from these tendencies. But what I think both Sue and Lisa are completely right about is the other long-term effects. Um, even if we um, might be more aware um, to certain false information, certain conspiracies um, floating around, if you look at the levels of trust in institutions, if you look at the levels of trust in the, in the spectrum of the media that is generally considered trustworthy, that is lower. That is lower than it's than it's yeah. ever been. Um, if you look at the position that Fox News um, um, holds, Fox News was able to consolidate um, its position um, as probably the most influential um, network um, cross um, cross platforms. And I think the other thing that has significantly changed that contributes to that is that a significant part of the mis, dis, and malinformation now yeah. comes from the institutions itself, from government, from the mm. president. And that is different because we have a different president than we had four years ago. Yeah. Jamil, can so, I, can, can yeah, I jump please, on the interference question? So yeah. um, I, the other thing that I think is a bit better is on the interference front, I think the government and the private sector have actually kind of rallied to be able to look at what's happening physically and anything yeah. that's a physical attack is easier to detect. That doesn't yeah. mean it's easy to detect. I'm just saying that physical things. So just the fact that they're able to see people trying to penetrate some sort of network, whether that's voter registration or something, right. we actually have gotten much better about sensing those things. Many yeah. more people are aware and we have many more facilities. So, 
And I would say the same thing goes for male. In other words, people trying to influence, to, to attack infrastructure is not necessarily new. Right. It tends to get caught. Yeah. yeah. Right. It, yeah. So even the mail-in ballots, you know, so people trying to defraud ballots is not right. new, it just tends to get caught. Right. And so I think that's where we probably feel a bit better about the actions that have been taken to protect the actual infrastructure over time. Yeah. No, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's actually heartening, I guess, in the sense that, you know, if we're at least focused on one thing, the infrastructure has gotten better. It may not be ideal, but at least we're, we're moving to a better place on that. Um, you know, I'm interested in these nation state actors, though. So, you know, we, we obviously know and we've heard all the reporting and the Senate report on Russian interference, notwithstanding, you know, certain politicians sort of suggesting there might not have been a, a Russian involvement. We'll put that all aside. Right. Um, we know the Russians were involved in 2016. We're hearing more, though, a drumbeat of discussion uh, coming out of the government, out of, intel out of the intelligence community, that there might be other players involved. Right. And it's not surprising. Right. Given that the Russians did it with largely and got away with it scot free, largely. Um, you know, it's not surprising the Chinese or the Iranians might be involved. You know, Sue, how much of that are you seeing or are you hearing about? You know, we've obviously heard reports about the DNI uh, being up on Capitol Hill briefing on the Chinese threat to the elections. Uh, we've seen reports coming out of uh, the National Counterintelligence Executive. Is that a real thing? Because there's been a lot of criticism saying, well, this is just politicians trying to divert attention from the Russian efforts, right? Yeah, exactly. What, what, what's going on here? Okay, so just remember, and I think Lisa said this really well, um, the digital environment is something that your competitors and adversaries use to affect their interests, yeah. right? You have to keep in mind that it's, it's their interests. And so, man, once this threat surface is exposed, you're gonna see Russia trying to affect their interests. They may be using the elections, but their interest is to undermine democracy, right? And so I worry yeah. about them a lot because the, really the only, way they hurt, the, way, the only way you hurt America is by making us not believe in ourselves. And believe Working pretty well, by the way, it doesn't work. Right. And so Russia is problematic and they're well organized and they've got great kind of cross domain capabilities. And so I worry about them a lot and right. they can. So when you see the social arrest and you see the divisions that we're creating for ourselves, they're just going to exploit them. China's got a different interest and that is no less interest in achieving theirs, but those tend to be a little right. bit more economic, their kind of dominance. And so you're going to see them either trying to get information that advances their position or get people in place that are gonna be favorable to their policies. Iran is gonna have a different set of interests. So it is true that you're going to see a lot of actors using the fact of the elections to try and shape who we are, who our leaders are, yeah. what our beliefs, what our agreements are, but they're gonna be different based on who the actor is. So it isn't, yeah. it isn't untrue and it isn't a dodge to say there are a lot of players, but I do think there's a differentiation in the seriousness or how yeah. they're using it. And I'd love to hear how Lisa and Nicholas see that. Yeah, well, so let me ask you, Nicholas. So, I mean, if this isn't the first time, you know, 2016 was the first time we've heard about foreign actors trying to sort of shape the environment, shape the battle space uh, to benefit them and their interests as Sue describes it, right? Um, is there something different though about what happened in 16 and what's happening in 2020 when it comes to this influence effort, um, either with the Russians and or now potentially with the Chinese and Iranians that is different uh, either in, in scope, in nature or in effectiveness? Um, I think there's something different on both sides of the equation that it takes for actual impact or influence. One, I think, for sure, they have become better in their operations, significantly better. I mean, if you compare that with the type of stories that uh, we know from the Cold, Cold War era and the um, then uh, um, attempts to influence public um, public discourse in the United States, I mean, if you if you if you put that side by side, the old efforts were sort of ridiculous. And um, what we have seen is they have gotten much better. They have invested both in terms of technological capacity, but also in terms of intelligence as it relates to how you can actually shape um, discourse, who you have to address, in what situation do you have to address people, and what kind of message do you feed them. I right. think that is something that has significantly changed. But I think what also has changed is the receptiveness of the country, meaning mm. the receptiveness of, of voters for those kinds of things. We know yeah. from, other, um, uh, from other examples, such as targeted, targeted advertising, that 
you might react to a message completely different depending on what situation mm -hmm. and what circumstances you are in at the moment at which you receive that message. Right. So um, if, um, if I want to be very effective um, with marketing, I don't know, a drug to you, then I would try to feed you that message at a time when you are very ill, very receptive for that kind of message. If I want to yeah. make you scared, I will try to exploit your feelings and what do I need for that? I need to know about your feelings. And then I can be more, more effective. Now, if we, if we stick with that and try to think about, well, what is, the, what is the most receptive nature of a society to absorb these kinds of, um, these kinds of false messages, this kind of disinformation? Well, yeah. it is a very polarized society, for example. It is a yeah. very tribalist political environment. It is an environment of high inequality, and I think if you look at uh, if you look at that, then um, the climate of 2016 as well as the climate of 2020 very much matches this. Um, yeah. Well, I don't want to call it ideal because obviously it's not ideal, but ideal for the for the reception of uh, misinformation and disinformation. So, Lisa, what about that? I mean, you know, your 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 organization is sort of dealing with this with this situation right in this moment, right, and and have for a while. Um, talk to us about how you think about this problem, you know, and, and our vulnerability to these this type of messaging, right? How do we how do we think about becoming more resilient? Are there strategies that either social media companies can take or private other private actors can take? Are there things that are there are there actions that we as consumers of information might take or as a society might do to become more resilient to the kind of things that that Nicholas is talking about, or or, or you know, sort of create a less sort of I don't know conducive environment for the attacker. So absolutely, there's a lot more that we could be doing that yeah. we're just not, and we need to start taking some serious action. So the way we think about disinformation is it is targeting us as citizens and trying mm -hmm. to influence our behavior. So in the case of an election, it's really targeting two key decision points, whether or not to vote and for whom to cast your ballot. And so when you boil it down in that way, you're able to then say, okay, what is it that I'm trying to protect? If I'm trying to protect these two decision points, then you can think in degrees of magnitude in terms of what matters um, in terms of protecting your goal. Right. And so I think about it, um, you know, we have to stop what's happening right now as it relates to the 2020 election. And that's where we can do things like work with the social media platforms to identify um, and unearth. So what we do is we work with our clients to be able to produce in-depth analyses to understand mm -hmm. where information is coming from to the extent possible where we'll attribute actors. But, you know, as has been pointed out, that's getting harder and harder as actors mm -hmm. get better at covering their tracks. We're now seeing foreign adversaries operate out of third party countries, typically those sure. that were clients during the Cold War. Um, and so what it is that we'll see is um, we'll see these disinformation campaigns being launched against users. And then we have to determine what do we do about it? And it, it isn't always the same answer. And it's really important to let the analysis drive that decision making process as an organization. So organizations right. can do everything from try to counter message to affected populations going back to this being essentially a big data project for our adversaries. Um, if we can figure out who it is that they're targeting and what biases they're using to then target those individuals, we can fight back through counter messaging. We can try to stop the inoculation mm. process and meet people where they are. And I'm not talking about fact checking because as it's been pointed out, people don't really trust the media anymore. We're operating in an environment where we need to get more creative than that. Um, yeah. you know, we figure out how to get Kid Rock to do some um, voter awareness on um, when election day is. So um, we do need to start thinking, I think, more creatively and more strategically in terms of how are we going to reach these people? Um, yeah. We also need to demand more from the social media platforms. Um, you know, it's not their fault that this is happening, but it's happening on their turf. And so we need yeah. to demand more in terms of transparency for users and an investment in additional um, preventative measures, which has yet to be taken. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that we need to do is also um, be able to realize that the, the adversaries know where the lines are and what the authorities are for government. Um, and so that means, you know, they are doing things like amplifying individuals who have First Amendment protected speech to say whatever it is that they want to say, but that doesn't mean that they have the right to then go viral with false information. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've seen some steps um, about 
some social media platforms are trying to take steps to address this. But my question is always, why are you trying to take steps in October when you've known this is coming for the last four years? Right. As users, there's a lot we can do to protect ourselves as well. So if we know that disinformation is targeting us, that means we are empowered to not let it. And so if yeah. we can think critically, if we can understand that if a story that we're being shown from a random blogger, from a URL we've never seen before, maybe we should trust that less than what's gone through editorial review. Yeah. Doing simple things like approaching your social media feed the way you approach um, reading a newspaper, looking at the author, the date, what publication are you reading, that can go a long way. And the last thing I'll say is our adversaries are also relying on us to enable their operations. And what I yeah. mean by that is they want us to share disinformation because people tr in our networks, and when I say our networks, I mean our friends, our family, our communities, they trust us. And if so we don't play into that and we don't share things that aren't true if we don't send it, even if we're trying to call it out and say, hey, I'm retweeting this just to let everybody know that it's fake, that is actually increasing its relevance within the algorithm so that that right. piece of content gets shown to other people. So yeah. the best thing you can do to protect yourself and your community is to not share disinformation and to report it through platform measures as you see it. It'll take a while for the platforms to actually get around to detecting yeah. it, but um, do your part, I would say, in protecting yourself against yeah. and your communities against disinformation. Yeah. So that's really helpful. And those are some interesting ways to think about the problem and in particular the way you think about my, maybe your own role in that process. Um, you know, Sue, one of the things that Lisa talked about right at the beginning of her, of her response to my question was about this uh, this sort of uh, differentiation between affecting whether somebody votes and who they vote for, right? Um, and I see that we have a question from from the audience. And by the way, for folks in the audience, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat now in the Q, in the Q and A function. Now uh, we'll either ask them along the way or we'll get to them towards the end at, at around the forty minute mark. But I do see a sort of relevant question from Michael Nelson. Um, and Sue, so what he's asking is, look, you know, uh, the IC has typically said um, that there's not compelling evidence to show that uh, Russian influence actually changed the outcome. Right. This is Talisa's point about 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 you know uh, either either whether you vote or or who you vote for. But what Mike Michael points out is that Kathleen Hall Jamison, who's at University of Pennsylvania, has done a study, you know, cited by Jane Mayer in the New Yorker, uh, which suggests that actually uh, there was vote suppression uh, by distant Russian disinformation that drove turnout down, perhaps among amongst minority communities, and that may have changed the results of the election. Have you looked at this question at all, and, and do you have any thoughts on this topic? Um, uh, either whether it's about specifically Kathleen Hall Jameson and, and her, her view of this, or more generally about the sort of distinction between whether you vote and who you vote for? Yeah, so, um, uh, so a little tutorial on intelligence. Intelligence yeah. is just about, about what is, and when you say you don't have evidence of it, what you mean is you don't have evidence of it. Typically, right. it is in the job of the intelligence community to determine the legitimacy of an election or not. So, so when the IC says that, it's saying exactly what it said. Um, I do think it turns out to be problematic to look at something after the fact and then go look for evidence backwards. We see this all yeah. the time. If you remember the under bomber and all those, so many intelligence failures are so obvious failures when you know something has occurred right. and then you go backwards and look for it. Um, I do think that kind of study is really important yeah. because we really do have to understand all the mechanisms that are changing the expected distribution of how voting happens. You don't want it to be disproportionately shaped. My question would be, I think it would be really hard to determine that it was the Russian influence and not other people who are trying to do different kinds of voter suppression. And that's one of the challenges the intelligence community always has when it tries to make that assessment. There are so many other yeah. factors. How do you net them out and decide which one? So I'm all for the continued study. Yeah. I do think it is hard to look backwards and decide that something happened that changed it because there could be so many factors that went into it, not just foreign actors. Right. But that kind of work to look at what is artificially changing what would be naturally occurring is an important right. element of what we're trying to distinguish. Right. So and I'll how to distinguish between between what might have otherwise happened and what happened as a result right. of the influence, right? That's the challenge. Right, and so that's what's so interesting about this whole misinformation, disinformation. It's it's not what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. It's about what's naturally occurring and not naturally right. occurring. Right, right, right. What so, so, and shaped and influenced. Yeah, you know, on, on a related point, uh, you know, Nicholas, um, uh, 
Katie Flynn asks uh, about a point that Lisa was raising about what the platforms are doing. Um, how does the refusal by Twitter and Facebook to allow factual information, for, for example, from the New York Post, I presume that uh, Katie's talking about the, the Biden story, um, how does that uh, sort of lead to distrust of the media? We know uh, from a Gallup poll in late September um, that uh, upwards of 60% of our population um, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't trust uh, the, the media, right? So 27% trust the media not very much, and 33% of the American public trust the media not at all. And I'm talking about mass media, but still an astounding number to your point about Fox News, right? Um, does, 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 does efforts that are ostensibly well-intentioned, I, I know there are people who don't believe they're well-intentioned, right? But are ostensibly well-intentioned to try, try and address disinformation, how does that, how did those efforts, my, how might those efforts undermine actually their effort uh, by, uh, by, you know, by, by, by silencing voices that people actually want to hear and think are legitimate? Yeah, that's a fantastic point, and it's incredibly hard to try to balance these two because, uh, on the on the one hand, you have um, a clear effect, which is you stop or at least slow the spread of certain messages. Meaning yeah. that um, I think um, the new uh, the the Twitter's actions as well as Facebook's actions with respect to this specific piece of our um, information, meaning this New York Post um, article, might well have slowed down the spread. And especially have might have slowed down the spread of that information to people who are not in the core of um, certain conspiracy um, uh, corners of the internet. Yeah. There, it, I think it is important to distinguish. And for the sake of simplicity, let's just look at like two different groups of people. You have one group of people who is very, very deep into certain circles that circulate um, uh, specifically false information. They don't necessarily rely on Facebook or Twitter. They have their, they have their channels that um, Facebook and Twitter doesn't, will never be able to shut down. Right. Either they use other platforms or they use private right. groups or they right. use- 4chan, 8chan, all that, right. All whatever, right. whatever they right. use. Whatever. So right. th those will not be affected. Now there's a different set of people that um, might have certain connections into these circles, but largely operates outside of these circles. They might they might generally be on Facebook, but they might yeah. have a couple of friends that maybe are um, at, the, at the borderline to this first group that I described. And with, they are not like on 4chan. They are not in highly problematic WhatsApp groups and so on. Yeah. They don't necessarily pass that on in a, in a secretive manner. Um, those are the ones that are affected by um, the slowdown of the spread of certain messages. Now, this is, I think, the, 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 the mechanism by which this can, these actions can sort of positively influence um, the overall discourse. Now, you asked about whether that does generally fuel the distrust in, in media, yeah. intermediaries more generally. And I think, again, you can sort of distinguish between these groups. So you have the, the core group. Um, they will certainly trust the media and intermediaries even less. But then again, are they even reachable? Like, did they trust yeah. the media and the intermediaries before? And there I'd probably say, well, no, <laughs> they have started at zero and they'll end up at zero. Yeah. Um, and um, this other group there, it very much will depend on um, whether, whether or not they just don't reach, that, whether that message simply doesn't reach them and if it doesn't reach them at all, then their trust in media will probably be not, not affected any, any further. But if they now are exposed to a feedback loop, let's say a president that then complains about the bias against him, yeah. of course, that is a mechanism by which you see, potentially see um, further distrust of the media. But then yeah. again, um, this, will, this, will, this will occur irrespective of what you yeah. do. Because there is no way to be so-called neutral. If you allow messages to spread, that also affects the trust in media. Because then you will have people saying, "Well, see, these are the companies that distribute this kinds of, these kinds of news." If the New York Times has a certain um, headline that um, that doesn't call out fake inf false information, then you'll you'll have a bunch of people saying that, "Well, um, the New York Times itself." is right. less trustworthy because they don't call out that kind of right. And right. So I, I don't think there's a neutral way that's kind of, that, that, that avoids yeah. that kind of feedback loop. 
Well, well, Lisa, how do we, I mean, how do we deal with this sort of problem? Because, you know, uh, you know, Nicholas makes some good points, right? But he say, he, he makes the point that, look, maybe the message doesn't get to the, the sort of, let's talk about only the audience that we care about, right? Let's put aside sort of the extremes, say they're unreachable, right? Just take the, sort of the middle ground, right? It's still a pretty small middle ground, given that 60% of the American public distrust the, the mass media, right? But take that middle group and say, okay, you know, we want to reach those people and they're, and they're sort of gettable, right? Even if they're gettable, if they don't get this messaging, right? They might hear the messaging, oh, well, the reason you didn't get that messaging was Twitter and Facebook are biased, right? I mean, you know, there is this view out there, right? That the reason why Twitter and Facebook didn't put the New York uh, poster out there is not because they were trying to control this information, but because they don't like conservatives, right? Or they don't like conservative viewpoints and they're trying to protect Hunter Biden or whatever it is, right? Um, there's a, one, of our, one of our questions JC Hers asks about the dueling conspiracy theories. What about sort of, you know, Sheldon Whitehouse's conspiracy theory about Amy Coney Barrett and dark money and Ted Cruz's rebuttal, right? I mean, do we worry that, um, that, that these platforms, which are supposed to be these, you know, bastions of free speech and they're, they're sort of the, the technology equivalent of the, of, the, of the, you know, the park, right? And maybe they're not, maybe that's part of the problem, right? Uh, but if they are that, how do we solve this problem? Is there a solution or is, is, this, is this just unsolvable? And no matter what you do, these companies, they're, 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 they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. Yeah, it's a great question. And so I think a couple of things. So first of all, I think there is no problem that we can't solve. So I think the idea that we can't do anything, it's, it just doesn't, the question is, what do we do? Not of all of the many things we could be doing. Um, and so I think a couple of things. So first of all, I want everybody to take a minute to think about their own social media algorithms. Um, I'm going to use myself as an example. I pride myself on being painfully moderate. The only thing that shows up in my Twitter feed is like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. That's all I see organically. Um, that being said, I never see Fox News. I never see the Huffington Post. I never see, I mean, I see it when I'm doing my research for work, but um, those algorithms mean something. There are entire echo chambers that I would not organically see if I weren't seeking them out. And that is right. not the public square. That is not the reality of your geographical community. So I think we need to take that into consideration when we talk about the algorithms, because if we know that fact checking doesn't work, okay, well, the social media platforms have already tagged and identified the biases of all of these different um, news sources. Right. Why should they be organically scrambled in your feeds? And those are the types of questions that I think we need to start asking when it comes to transparency into the algorithms. I also think we need to start really putting this into context, right? Russia, China, Iran, they're not sitting there blogging for the sake of blogging. They're trying to influence you and get you to do something. And so we have to also consider the real world harm that can be caused from this. And I'm going to use an example that uh, my colleague, Cindy Otis, Cindy Otis and I um, released via the Washington Post, I believe last week, but with this news cycle, what is time? Um, and so we took a look at the militias that were operating in Michigan and how they were, yeah. um, how they were organizing online. And so I think we need to talk about this with the algorithms too, because the algorithms are great if it, let's say you are somebody who it notices you like houseplants, you post a lot of pictures of being outside and nature. And so all of a sudden you're being recommended these like local meetup groups to find people who want to go hiking. That's okay. great. What happens if you are somebody who is biased to white supremacy, you may show some signs of neo-Nazism and you like your local militia Facebook page. And then all of a sudden you're being algorithmically recommended to co connect with other militia groups. So that's concerning. There's a big- or ISIS. Yeah, or ISIS. It's the same exact thing. And that's what we're seeing here at home. So I really can't stress this enough that these platforms are in fact enabling, um, you know, a lot of good, but they're also enabling yeah. things that we as Americans do not value, like yeah. violent militia groups seeking to kidnap a governor. Those are things that are just frankly un-American, and we need to start demanding the technology platforms that will enable us to connect with one another, especially in times like today yeah. during pandemic where we can't all be together, but do so in such a way that is actually reflective of yeah. the democratic ideals that these platforms, you know, purport to uphold and believe in. And so I don't think that we can keep throwing up our hands and saying, this is a technical issue. It's too complicated because there's a lot that we can be doing. Yeah. Well, so Sue, what about that? I mean, I, you know, I wonder whether uh, we're expecting too much of these, of these, of these technology companies, right? Like how are they 
supposed to decide? And, and frankly, do we want them deciding what's true, what's not true, what groups we like as a society, what groups we don't like? You know, we don't like ISIS, we don't like white supremacists and militias, but you know, liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans, that's okay, right? Where are the, how, how should we, one, is that expecting too much of these companies? Two, should they have that role? And is it fair to put them in that role? I realize it's a lot to ask of somebody who just came, you know, who came out of the government not so long ago, but I mean, that is sort of where the government's headed. We've sort of shifted that role to somebody else. Is that, is that, the, is that their job? Should it be their job, Sue? Oh, you're on mute. You know, I just gave the most brilliant answer and I can't. I know, it's so great. We missed it. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, let's see, that was a, like a, a seriously multi-part question. So I don't think we can put the genie back in the bottle about the government being the, the, the sole arbiter and the sole controller of good, bad, or in our safety, yeah. right? That, that, that went away when we got this digital world where it came to each one of our doorsteps and we could each have our fondest dreams and we were able to do things that were delivered to us at speed that the government couldn't keep up with in terms of regulating. Like I remember when I started, the government was the one that created the sensitive technologies and we knew they were sensitive because we were creating them and so we protected them we put things around that isn't what happens anymore so you know these companies it is legitimate for them to bear some responsibility for what's happening via their platforms i just i right. that's just a true statement um also realistically our processes to create statute and policy are way too slow to be the sole mechanism that we have in order to change our behaviors. Um, I do think there's a distinction uh, that I make between something that's legitimate and something that's illegitimate, something that's authentic and something that's not authentic. So okay. we do have laws that protect certain kinds of speech and certain kinds of un-American behavior, right? And so that should never be allowed. I don't care whether it's on um, a social media platform or not. So that's just a category to itself. Right. To me, the distinction, though, is someone who has something that I say, if it is represented, we can deal with that. Something that is artificially created, we should not have to have promulgated in the same way. So to me, there is an intermediate step here in looking at the authenticity of information. Okay. Um, whether that is someone who legitimately could proffer something because then you can assign it. And if I know where the information came from as a yeah. human and at, quite frankly, as a machine, I have more opportunity to decide for myself whether okay. I think yeah. that's a legitimate source. So I think there's something there in terms of authenticity that yeah. can help us, but the companies have got to own part of it. And then the government's got to yeah. catch up to doing its part. Yeah. So Nicholas, and, is that, does that approach make sense? Does it, <clears throat> does it make sense to sort of, you know, it's, it's like sort of the political ads approach, right? If you know who put it out there, you know who's funding it, right? At least that gives you a sense of where it comes from. I mean, you can decide how much credibility to assign it, right? Is that is that the right approach? Uh, you know, uh, and I noticed that uh, we've we, got- Don't you think if we had known, if we had been able to identify what was happening in 2016 as Russian, if it was obvious that someone had said, this is a Russian source that is saying this to you and is telling you that what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri, don't oh, yeah. you think that humans sure. were able to say, go, wait a minute. Sure. The problem, of course, though, right, Sue, is that, is that we know the Russians are now operating through, whether you believe it's through Rudy Giuliani or through, you know, American, Americans that they get to sort okay. of hold up and signs. Is the, the, the social yeah. media companies decided that there was sufficient skepticism that they were going to act. So I do think this yeah. notion of understanding where it originated does help people distinguish whether it sounds true or whether it doesn't. So, so Nicholas, Sue, Sue's got a, 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 a what I think is a reasonable approach to sort of the stuff that we know is directed by the by the opponents. But what about the point that Lisa made about you know um, Americans who are being rebroadcast and retweeted and and whose voices are being amplified by Russian bots and trolls and the Chinese bots and trolls, whatever. You know, uh, do we how do we how do we solve that problem? Because that problem. You know, there are a lot of Americans who, you know, there always have been Americans who believe in conspiracy theories or have, you know, whatever problematic view you might think of. What happens when those voices are being amplified, made more prominent, being pushed to people who who'll who'll trigger? You know, do we worry about that? Oh, yes. And so, what do we do about it? De de definitely, and do we? I I think we need to worry about it. Um, I I think 
I think to, to start with, um, yeah. both what Lisa and uh, Sue suggested, namely um, enhancing transparency, signif transparency significantly, um, is def definitely desirable. Like there's no doubt about it that um, labeling um, certain posts and the or origins of certain posts would make a lot of sense. It mm -hmm. would, I think, make a lot of sense to require um, any paid for post to be labeled as paid for explicitly and label it um, in terms of um, where it comes from. But then again, right. I'm not entirely sure whether that gets us all the way. Now, imagine you um, uh, you see a post and that is um, labeled as paid for by um, make up some group, Americans for, and then insert something. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily tell you whether or not that is a trustworthy source. And if it doesn't even tell you or me whether it's a trustworthy source, um, I'm not sure whether we can expect um, users that might glance over that to make, uh, to make that distinction. On the other yeah. point, distinguishing between um, sort of foreign sources and, and domestic um, sources of information, again, I'm not entirely sure whether we would on the one hand want to sort of establish different rules um, for um, foreign individuals posting information. Um, I'm not a US citizen, um, for just as an example, but at the same time, I don't know whether we would want to treat information that I post on Twitter different than information that um, um, citizens post on, on, on Twitter. Um, and I'm not sure whether, whether, whether that distinction in itself, uh, in itself might help. What I think could help is fundamentally tweaking the or changing the incentive structures for platforms. So far, platforms just have an incentive to create as much engagement as possible up to what I'd call the, the boiling point, right? They, they have an incentive to tune up the to tune up the incentive to tune up the engagement as far as possible mm -hmm. and then they step in just before it boils over that's a that's a sort of pattern that you see especially facebook following over the last couple of years yeah. um, facebook was happy with alex jones and, and until it was just not bearable anymore uh, and then they and then they stopped it facebook was happy um, and made millions of dollars um, indirectly with the through the engagement that was created by qanon and um, and supporters and then at some point it just didn't it just wasn't bearable anymore and they basically had to shut it down and yeah. what i think what could help is to try to change these underlying incentive structures. Is it really healthy that our entire digital public sphere rests on engagement um, affiliated funding? Is, 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 that really, is that really healthy? Now, I'm not saying I have like the golden solution to that, but um, if we look into the area before, um, before the digital public sphere, before um, social media, we still had engagement um, affiliated funding or advertisement funding as one of the major sources, but there was also different, there were different types of funding um, mm -hmm. available as a percentage of the funding of the entire digital, uh, of the entire public sphere. And I think that is a shift that is somewhat, somewhat unhealthy and um, amplifies um, bad incentives, incentives that only um, lead platforms and um, intermediaries to look for one thing and one thing only, and that's engagement. Yeah, no, that's, that's that's really interesting. So, so you know, one of the one of the sort of incentive based uh, you know challenges I think that we face in this space is this issue about Section Two Hundred and Thirty. It's been a hot topic up on Capitol Hill quite a bit. Uh, we just saw the president uh, talk about it recently. Uh, we saw the FCC chairman uh, say that he's going to look at Section Two Hundred and Thirty, and DOJ's put out some guidance. Um, you know, at least I'm interested to know how you think that uh, this protection, I want to describe for the audience, except they, they're not aware of it, Section 230, essentially part of the Communication Decency Act from 1996, uh, provides uh, liability protection for uh, platform companies uh, who create this, uh, you know, sort of a communications forum, uh, so they're not liable for what's posted on their sites. Um, and and I, that's, that's again, I, I know as a lawyer, it's, 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 not, it's not really great to summarize, but since I'm a recovering lawyer, I'm going to get, I'm going to get away with it um, and take take sort of the moderator's privilege, but there's a lot of talk about, about changing 230, creating some additional liability. Um, uh, you know, one of our questioners, uh, Kelly Casolas asks, uh, you know, how does that play in here? Uh, do you think that uh, Congress should take action to amend it? Um, another one of our uh, questioners asked, uh, 
you know, a related question about, you know, Michael Nelson asked about, you know, what about, what about, uh, you know, European laws like Net, uh, Nets DG, uh, which where they, where they fine internet companies, they don't remove hate speech. Um, what do we think about, about sort of these incentives, right? Is there, is there a way to modify the incentives, take away the care of liability protection, add some potential liability in lawsuits? Is that, is this an appropriate approach uh, to addressing this problem? And if so, what is, what should it look like? So it's a great question, and I'm going to preface this by saying I am not a lawyer, but I am a former Hill staffer, so I'm going to answer it anyways. Um, yeah. um, so a couple of things. I think, you know, Section 230 just, it's not, um, it, it's one of those um, provisions that I think is no longer uh, meeting the need of what we need our laws and regulations to be doing in order to address this threat. And where I always come back to, and I think that this is something that we still haven't answered yet as a society, um, and it's something that, you know, could be used to inform how we address Section 230 or um, other regulations is who is responsible for this, um, you know, so take maybe not even a foreign example, but I like to think about disinformation as a consumer protection issue, frankly. Mm. You're going to these social media platforms, you're going to these different um, sites for information. And if you're getting bad information, that then going back to what disinformation efforts are actually doing, it's trying to get you mm -hmm. to take action offline. Um, there can be real world harm associated with that. So sure. for example, take QAnon, um, because frankly, um, after Cindy's testimony yesterday in front of Hipsy, we're getting targeted right now. Um, you know, QAnon is targeting somebody. They are, um, you know, threatening individuals. They are getting in their cars and driving to pizza parlors. Um, who is responsible? Who is responsible for that level of organization? Who is responsible right. for the child who maybe sees a video telling them to take a certain, uh, do a craft video that's not safe is something that we've seen different disinformation outfits do in order to target children. Um, right. Who is responsible if that child gets hurt? Who should be paying the medical bills? Is it the parent for not adequately supervising um, the child's internet usage and their activities? Is it the social media platform for allowing harmful content to be on their, on their platforms? Is it um, the content creator who is the one who ultimately was instructing people? But Right now, there isn't necessarily any recourse for this. Um, you know, who you flag it for the platforms if it's found to be policy violating. Um, and keep in mind that the policies are all different from platform to platform and they're not right. Um, right. You know, then it'll come down. But if I'm a bad guy, I just make more accounts. Like, no big deal. Like, you're kind of doing this in perpetuity anyway, building these networks that can disseminate false information or information that's just going to ultimately be favorable to your goal. And so yeah. I think the thing that we need to think about when um, we're talking about regulation is what is the actual, what are the actual damages when we're talking about disinformation? What is it, you know, how do you measure the outcome of damages when it's an election or versus somebody being hurt versus an act of violence or in worst cases, loss of life? Um, yeah. when, what recourse do people who saw coronavirus misinformation back in March and were told that um, if they drink water every 30 minutes, they're not going to be able to catch the virus. They saw that, they believed it, and then maybe they didn't take appropriate social distancing measures. Who is, who is responsible? Um, and so these are the sorts of questions that I think we don't have answers to yet, or there hasn't been meaningful uh, meaningful proposals put forward. And that is, in my view, what should be driving this sort of legislative and regulatory conversation. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. But, Sue, thoughts on that? I mean, what, no, how, I do we, how do we, yeah. Um, Bill Gates always recommends his book, Angels of Our Better Nature. And the thesis is that actually we have never been less physically violent in history than we are right now. It may not feel that way, but numerically it's true. And it's just because over time, organizational theory and leadership and societal norms drove it not a good way for us to approach our differences. I would say in the digital environment where we are absent leadership norms and organizational theory, we are asymptotically approaching 100% in what the digital equivalent of violence is. And we have got mm. to address it. So I totally agree with what Lisa said. Yeah. We've got to find some structures to be able to do this because it, um, Cindy's experienced it. I experienced it for the incredibly um, horrible act of the president not asking me to continue in my position and you would not believe 
what happened to me in social media, even though I had nothing to say. Yeah. That to be so fair, to be fair, you were very, you had a very effective response to that, to that request to departure. Let's just, let's be right. I mean, it, it made it out there on the social media. Yeah. And I'm a pretty self-actualized woman. Yeah. But it was still difficult to see and hear if you are someone who is already disenfranchised and yeah. things that seem real seem to be talking about someone who's real, who's done something to you. We've got to do something societally about this. I couldn't agree yeah. with what Lisa said. And, and how do we, and, and Sue and Lisa, how do we, I mean, how do we do that, right? I mean, do we, do we set standards? Do we set rules? I mean, is the government really, is the government really capable? I mean, does this have to come up from the ground up? Is that to be a societal ground? So like, how does this problem get solved? I mean, is this, is, do, is, are we sort of at a, at a, at, again, I, this, is, this is almost sort of the wrong analogy, but are we at a me too moment for, for society on these type of issues? I mean, how do we, how do we address these things? I, this is simplistic and I don't know how to do it, but I would say is there are societal no, norms back in the day that we thought we were a society. And what you have to do is then take those norms and instantiate them in a digital environment, yeah. to work through what it is. You're not escalating government privilege. We yeah. don't want to escalate government privilege. We've done that before and that is not who right. we want to be. We don't want to become authoritarian, but you do have to say, what are what is our rule of law? What are our norms? And how do you now put that into a digital environment? And it's going to look different yeah. than the rules and norms look like in a physical world, but we, I still believe we can do it. Yeah. And Lisa, thoughts? It. Yeah, Lisa, yeah. thoughts on that? So I just have one more kind of framing thing to mention. So we yeah. know that disinformation primarily targets minorities, women, um, the disabled, et cetera, and so, or persons with disabilities, excuse me. And so it's- um, Lisa, can I, I, can I ask a question there? Is it, Lisa, is it targets or effects or both? I think both. So we yeah. know that it targets women um, specifically. We've seen that through a lot of research. Um, Danielle Citron, you know, she's been looking at this since Gamergate. She is one of the most brilliant thinkers on how do we protect um, individuals online. Um, but I think this is an issue where it disproportionately targets women. Um, you know, it's um, it disproportionately targets people of color. We know that the African American community that um, the Latino community were disproportionately targeted when it comes to 2016 election interference. Like these are just things that we we know. And so I think we need to take that into consideration as well. If we're really trying to create an internet that is safe for everyone to use to be able to connect, if it's not safe for everyone, that's something yeah. that we need to consider as well. Are we all able to enjoy the same rights? And then I think the other pieces, and you know, we do this, but um, it's who do you call like right yeah. now if like your image is being circulated on q and on message boards who do you call because that's the precursor yeah. to what's happening and like that's what i've been dealing with all morning and it's just those are yeah. the types of things that i think we need to keep in mind um when we're drafting this legislation is yeah. we're trying to make it so that we're trying to really balance a couple of things we're trying to balance privacy we're trying with security with freedom of expression, with the ability to connect. And it's gonna be hard to get the right mix, but the nice thing is that these can be dynamic solutions. We have to start somewhere because right now this continued period of inaction has made it so that the social media platforms are in effect writing their own rules, like arbitrating against their own rules and then enforcing whatever punishments there are or whether or not there is a punishment. Deplatforming only goes so far. So yeah. I think that's what we have to be thinking about. Yeah, yeah. So Nicholas, what about, uh, you know, one of our, one of our uh, uh, commenters, one of our questioners asked about, you know, uh, this, this point made by Sophie Zhang, one of the, a former Facebook data scientists, right? That, you know, she had seen a lot of attempts by foreign national governments to abuse the Facebook platform to mislead their own citizens. Uh, she's personally made decisions to enforce that, that, that have affected national presidents, uh, taking action to enforce against so many prominent politicians, she lost count. Um, I mean, what about that? I mean, what about the fact that these platforms are making, you know, big decisions that are hard? Um, and another one of our questioners asked about, you know, Kelly Casillas asked about, you know, this this uh, this handing of election day. You know, there's going to be a huge increase in mail in ballots, right? Uh, we're not sure we're going to know the winner by November fourth, right? Are there worries that uh, this could lead to post election violence? So it's sort of a combination of what role uh, are we are we concerned the platforms are playing an oversized role? And then what about overall media's role in addressing the potential threat post-election of potential violence. Yeah, those, those are great points. And factually speaking, there's no doubt that 
those uh, tech platforms have assumed a huge role in public discourse. Facebook is clearly the leading um, force in that, but but Twitter also has significantly the significant sway over public discourse in general. Now yeah. there, I would say at least two major um, routes how you can think about that normatively. Uh, there are people who say, well, they have assumed a very powerful position. And what we now need to do is we now need to establish certain processes that um, ensure the legitimacy of their power. Yeah. Um, that is a view that um, treats those platforms all, almost like governors, um, governors of speech, and says, well, if they have that powerful position, then we need to build up these mechanisms, these procedures, that their decisions are in fact fair. There's yeah. another stray, I think, to which I'm, to which I am uh, personally um, uh, feel more closely connected, and that is to say, well, if they have that strong of a position in society, then that position itself is the problem. We shouldn't yeah. necessarily focus on making their decisions internally fairer, or well, mm -hmm. we should maybe also do that, but this shouldn't be this shouldn't be where we that shouldn't be the basket in which we put all our eggs. We should acknowledge that as a problem in itself that they have to become too powerful. Now, I think they have to uh, they have become too powerful. Um, both in the market, meaning meaning vis-a-vis -vis other media outlets, um, it is not healthy for a public sphere if more or less uh, the entirety is dominated by one, two, or four companies. That is just not healthy. And mm -hmm. I think they have become too powerful vis-a-vis -vis the state, vis-a-vis -vis the regulator. And there, I think we need to have a very fundamental debate about a revival of um, the regulatory state and government within the within within the digital environment. If um, you look back to where where that basically started, that started with the endorsement um, or the sole endorsement of the private sector to oh. lead. That was under the um, that was um, sort of sort of quoting Bill Clinton here on this on his rules on e-governance in the 1990s. Um, and, and that worked well for, for, for a while. Why did that work well? Because you had a, a dynamic striving market with, with lots of alternatives, not with single players that dominated the entirety of public discourse. That has changed. We see incredible levels of concentration among platforms. And mm -hmm. these concentrations have led to shifts of power. Um, concentrations of private power. And I think that is something that needs to be fundamentally addressed and rebalanced. Yeah. Well, I think we've got time for probably one more question. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave with you. So you'll get the last word. So Paul Drury, one of our questioners asked uh, whether uh, the State Department Global Engagement Center is, was currently responsible for leading US government response to state and non-state propaganda. Is that the right place for the mission? Is the State Department the right place? And is that office the right place for this mission in the US government? Uh, it is a place, right? <laughs> it is certainly that. No, it, it, uh, so if you believe that this is not a unilateral U.S. position and there is a huge role yeah. for, for having free and open societies have this conversation because yeah. I will tell you amongst our allies and partners, this same concern is amplified many yeah. times over because they have smaller populations that are more susceptible one and it's it's a, a real common concern yeah. so i think from the perspective of unifying like-minded people against the common problem because it isn't just unique to us it's a place it is yeah. not the only place um, because you just have so many um other issues that are private sector based yeah. and solution space we need but it is a place Fair. Well, listen, Sue, thanks so much for coming. Lisa, Nicholas, so great to have you guys. Thank you to the National Security Law Journal and the International Law Journal for your support of this program. Um, I note that we have another event again next week, same time, 12 Eastern, uh, where we'll be talking about more solutions to the problem. And to Mohammed Dunia's question about whether NSI is a program in the media to help understand some of this context, we do have media programs where we try to engage the media and bring our national security experts to them. So not necessarily in this exact space, but a lot of these similar issues. So thanks to all of you for all your being here. Uh, thank you again, NSLJ and ILJ, and we'll see you all next week at noon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Lisa. Great job, Nicholas. Thanks, Jamil. Thank you.
Thank you. Pleasure discussing with you. And Jamil, thank you so much for having us. Yeah.